Well, that's easier to hold. Hey. Hey, hey, hey. So this is the bear garden. And one has to, uh, when gardening, one has to imagine what the garden's going to look like, not what it does look like now. So it's, uh, it's the middle of winter, so there isn't, or, you know, it's the end of winter, so there isn't a lot here. But let's look at what is here. There is an aronia plant. There is an olive, baby olive tree. Mediterranean herbs for bee forage. You can see the blue, uh, blue blossoms already on the rosemary. Bees love that. It's the first sort of nectar-bearing plant around here that the bees will fly to as soon as it's warm enough to fly. And then lots of lavender. This bed is asparagus. The asparagus isn't up yet, I don't think. We could look. It is. Look at this. Here's an exclusive. Here is an exclusive. <coughs> what the hell is the camera on this thing? There it is. See that? That is the first asparagus of the season on its way up. And here are some new new asparagus crowns that I planted this year. And there's some asparagus coming up there. Wow, fantastic. So the asparagus is about to come up. <coughs> asparagus is an annuity. Yeah. <laughs> it's an annuity crop. You plant it uh, in trenches and you really can't harvest for about three years. So you sort of have to put in more than you should because by the time it comes up, you really want to have lots of asparagus. And so, and then the beds last for 15, 20 years, you know, if well maintained. There's a fig tree. This is where Jerusalem artichokes live. Let's see if, I don't know what that is. An allium of some kind. Uh, here's some Jerusalem artichokes. They're starting to do their thing. They can be invasive, not invasive, but they're persistent. Any little chunk of Jerusalem artichoke will uh, will make more Jerusalem artichokes. So you just leave a few chunks in the ground and they make more every year. This big area here is where I put my annual beds. So those will be coming up. This is a, what do you call it? Pineapple guava, feoa, zeloiana. And it has not borne fruit yet, but it will at some point. Here's a pile of mulch ready to be applied. I have pine needles in profusion, so I use those as mulch and have been using them for years. So the annual stuff will go in here. Here is garlic walk down the row of garlic. That's all garlic. Garlic is easy to grow in the garden and it's fantastic. So you put it in it here, around here, you put it in October and it grows through the winter and will be ready around July 4th. Here is a pond. It's a stock watering thing with fish in it. They're down there at the bottom. You can see, if you can, there's ice. I just broke the ice. There's a little bit of ice on here, so it's kind of cold. Here's some more. Here's my beloved pooch. Hi, sweetheart. How are you? I know, you can't go in the garden. You can't go in here. What do you want? Oh, whoa, oh, oh, whoa, oh. whoa. <laughs> You're a good girl. I know. Yeah, people say don't use people. You'll hear people sometimes conf get confused and say, "Oh, pine needles. You can't use those for mulch because they'll acidify the soil." But that you don't till them into the soil, and any um, any composting of that material that's going on is going on at a very low level, or at a, you know, there's just not a lot of that that breaks down. 
and uh, at the end of the season I pile it up. So I've been using it for years and I don't worry about it. The t soil has tremendous buffering capability. So here is uh, something. Something winter. The meadow voles came and ate all of my winter vegetables, cabbages and things, with the exception of a few straggling. That's a guy, a giant red mustard. And uh, so the winter garden was eaten. It was crushed by the snow and then eaten by various things. This is goji berry. <laughs> no, she's just locked out of the garden. <laughs> She has a you know an acre to run around in, but she's just not allowed in here, so she doesn't dig. She's not permitted. Oh, I see. Okay. This low plant here, here's a grapevine. The grapes have they broken bud yet? Let's see. No. They're not quite awake. They'll be awake probably in a week or two if it gets warm. This is uh, lingonberry. Lingonberry is a you know a Swedish. It's a vaccinium. I don't remember vaccinium something or other, but it's like a low wild cranberry, huckleberry, lingonberry, uh, blueberry relative. This is pomegranate. I have good feeling about pomegranate granite this year. It was put in maybe it's maybe in its fifth year, and it bore uh, one or two fruit. Yes, last year, and it aborted a bunch of flowers, but it tried. So I think it's going to be. I think it's feeling sexy this year, and it's going to going to bear a bunch of fruit. And down this row is strawberries. They're always a, a good performer. I had to put up this sort of infrastructure of poles and old tent stakes and stuff to put uh, netting over it because the birds will eat them all. The raspberries. This is dinkum, an Australian ra ever-bearing raspberry. So they're awake. And they're ever-bearing raspberries, so you don't have to do cane management. They grow every year, and they produce fruit on this year's wood, on the primocanes. And then... You can just cut them to the ground, as you, as evidenced here, and they grow up again. Other cane berries you have to deal with. They grow fruit on next year's wood, so they're on a two-year cycle. But these are on a one-year cycle, so easier to deal with. This is um, Laurelis nobilis, Grecian bay laurel. It pruned itself heavily in the snow. It broke here, so it had a much nicer shape, but... A lot of pl uh, a lot of the snow came and kind of trashed it pretty good, so I had to come out here and cut these out. So it's looked prettier. Here's one of the earliest spring vegetables: rhubarb, 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 rhubarb. Coming up nicely. Down here is more asparagus. This is a black currant. You can see the black currant is awake too. And I'm looking down here at this asparagus to see if it's rolling. Not yet. It's a little cooler, shadier down at this end of the garden. Different, different sun patterns. But the rhubarb's up nice. As is the sorrel. This is sorrel. It has a consistency or a, a leaf feel like um, spinach, but it's incredibly sour. I'm going to eat some sorrel. Mmm. It's not too sour yet, but it'll get sour or mmm. Yeah, it's pretty sour. Here's a gooseberry. And another gooseberry. This one is a little more thorny. I can't remember what this one is. This one is, I think, picks well, which means it's easy to pick because it isn't so thorny. And here's a bunch of cuttings and transplants ready for the edible forest garden or getting ready. So a lot of blueberry cuttings, when you prune blueberries, you can just jam them into a... Um, what is it, Lola? Oh. It could be that one of my dog's many boyfriends is 
the boyfriend dogs is about to visit. Uh, so these are, I'm sorry, I'm spacing on the uh, the dog situation and on looking at the chat. Well, thank you. Yeah, pomegranate. Um, so these are all cuttings and they're, they're rooting right now. So in a year, these will be able to go maybe out into my forest garden, um, stitching in this actinidia cutting. There's all kinds of cuttings. You'll have to excuse the garden, the disarray of the garden. It's, you know, it's been winter. This has all been under a foot of snow for once a month. This is my garden shed. It's a shower, a fiberglass shower that my neighbor was throwing away that I turned upside down, and it just so happened that this uh, screen door fit right on it. So there are tools in there, but it is a shower. I poured a pad for it because the uh, wood rats and stuff were living under it, so now they can't live under it, so they live on top of it. And what's down here? There's a lot of self-heal growing, just grows wild at self-seeds. It's a medicinal plant. This is a yosta berry, which is a, a combination of a currant and a gooseberry. This is an elderberry. Gold beer, so it's a gold flowered elder or a golden elderberry. And uh, this was only in the ground a year. It looks like it's a little angry about the frost, but it's awake. And what else? Lots of oregano. More goji berry. Another grape that is not awake. Here's the kiwi growing up a trellis. This trellis is made from an, a. Uh, this was a, uh, a futon. So there's half the futon, and there's the other half of the futon. And here's a red currant, and it has flowers on it. You can see there's that'll be red currants. This is the male kiwi. Kiwi needs male and female plants to make babies. All this stuff is a, a screen tent that I have to drape around everything to keep the birds out of the blueberries, which are in this step back. This sort of structure is a blueberry structure that I've built. So we'll go down and into the blueberries. This is the blueberry patch. This hose right here I used to pump uh, when I had ducks before the bears ate them. The duck pond, when I pumped it out, it was like a nitrogen charged battery, right? The water, so I would pump it out into these blueberries for fertilizer. And uh, so these are different kinds of blueberries, some of which are, as you can see, deciduous, and some of which are evergreen. And this, look at this one. This is my champion plant right here in the middle. You can see all these flowers. It's hard to get the focus right on this. All these flowers will be clusters of blueberries. And this, this bush in particular just kills. And they're huge. They're about the size of a nickel, you know, around. So there's those. And there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, maybe eleven blueberry bushes in here. And there's a, uh, let me get by here. Because there's a huckleberry, a tall mountain huckleberry that, uh, that looks kind of cool. There's a huckleberry, and it's never given a huckleberry. Ooh. This Justin TV kills the battery dead. It's awesome. Uh, this is a huckleberry, and it took it about three years to get over to get over it and start growing again. It was really uh, unhappy with being moved. It was moved from wherever it was in Oregon or something. I got it from a nursery in Oregon. So here's the lingonberry, and as you can see, the lingonberry creeps, so it's all over the place under all these things. And I have to do all kinds of heroic measures to keep birds out of this garden. They will eat every single blueberry. <laughs> there is. And this is a plant that, uh, what is this? This is a viburnum, I think. 
Highbush Cranberry of the variety Ukraine. Grown in Clackamas, Oregon. Clackamas County, Oregon. So this is a shade tolerant. It produces a a berry, I believe. It hasn't done it yet. There's a theme there, did you notice? <laughs> Uh, when you're gardening, especially with these annuals, I mean these perennial crops, you, or these perennial fruit-bearing things, you put them in and have to wait um, sometimes years and years. So anyway, that's kind of the main garden. And then out here, this disastrous bear patch of earth is where the ducks used to live before the bears came and killed them all. So this is actually my new garden. There's the ducks pond that they used to love to swim in. Here's where my, this is the grave of my beloved acorn who passed away in December and she is going to, growing on her is a native um, tiger lily. So there's a bunch of native tiger lily um, starts that are going to come up when it gets warm and this is um, horseradish and she is lending her body to she is lending her body to these these are new uh, nectarines and peaches that I put in so and these are flowering I don't think that's uh I don't think the flowers are going to stay because I think it's supposed to snow. But if I have a nectarine, let's see what kind is this. <clears throat> oh, that's the rootstock. This is called Arctic J. It's a white nectarine. Peach leaf, uh, peach leaf curl resistant, and this is called Q18. What a wonderful name. <laughs> It's a white peach, and there will be another one there when I get one. No, I'm just a, I'm just a hobbyist. I'm an El Dorado County Master Gardener, so I'm a, a trained, and I give um, gardening classes to the public. But, um, but no, it's just something I like to do. And my teacher schedule allows me to spend a great deal of time out here in the summer, for instance. So, so this whole area is going to become a new garden annex. And here is the compost pile. That's straw from the duck's pen right now. But, um, but look at that. It's becoming wonderful organic material. So no chemicals in this garden. This is all organic. Uh, I grow heirloom. In terms of the annuals, I grow heirlooms and open pollinated varieties, and uh, and that kind of thing. So anyway, I'll stop. I think I'm going to stop broadcasting. Yeah, you can. You can grow a whole lot of things, but uh, but my seasons are really short and sort of brutal. It goes from being cold and snowy to being incredibly hot here and it's a short short season so picking varieties is really important things uh, that have short growing seasons to fruit and uh, in terms of annuals so yeah there's some constraints but it, it is I think uh, generally pretty easy to grow things in California as compared to some other spots so anyway that's the garden from way back here and uh well, thank you. Thanks for setting all this up, man. You're a champion and a hero, as are all of you. This is, uh, no, it's Professor.